Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. The time is 2.03 a.m. This is our weekly commissioner status update, calling this meeting to order. Joining us by phone, Commissioner Bill Brooks. In person, Commissioners Duncan and Filios. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, our first and a very welcome guest this morning is a presentation of the USS Idaho, which is a submarine commissioning committee presentation by Mr. Henry Netzer, sponsored by Bill Brooks. Sir, go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can Mr. Brooks see this? Uh, yeah, he's on, he can see it on YouTube, right? Yes. Thanks for your service and uh, your, your work with the community. You're very welcome. You had a busy day. Wave me off whenever I go too long. Okay, so a little bit about uh, who am I? I'm the chair of the North Region Committee for the uh, Commission Committee. Uh, a little bit of my background. I was selected for nuclear training, had my Admiral Yerkofer's interview. I was trained in Vallejo and prototyped on Idaho, Idaho. Served on a fast attack submarine out of Hawaii, the Hawko, and that sail of Hawko is at the Arco Submarine Museum. That's just down the first six and six, so we have a stake in numbers. Uh, worked for 20 years with the Navy Research and Development. Sir, you you're welcome to remove your mask if you'd oh. like. Yeah, and then we actually have a, a mobile. Um, yeah, if you. This one go? Nope, she's got one there for you. Oh, right sir? Handheld. All the way over there. Handheld. Yeah. Okay, just because I'm not a submarine doesn't mean I don't talk with my hands. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've served 20 years with the Navy. I think you still have to get it right up there. Okay, I think she uh, turned it on for you. This one yeah, of those just goes to close. Directly. You should be fine. Oh, well, is that there better? There you go. go. Yes. Okay. Ruined my chances of being elected governor for sure. <laughs> uh, I ended up at the research at, uh, base up at Bayview. Worked there where the cutthroat model was the hull shape for the Virginia. So Virginia class submarines, so the USS Idaho was one of them, had its genesis in Bayview. Our Lady in County McGee's with the Daughters of the American Revolu uh, yeah, Revolution. She was the sponsor for the cutthroat. Little history on the USS Idaho. Uh, you can read that in Hannah Hearn's own free flow. Oh, and go right ahead. Unique opportunity. Class was a proud ship. Uh, commanded by Mr. Sam Weinstein. Unique opportunity for Idaho. As a landlocked state, we have a lot of solid <coughs> reasons for this unique opportunity. Let's look at the commission. Chris, we need to get closer to the microphone. Just, just hold it in closer, okay, please. Yeah, it yeah, it's handheld, Bill. We, we've got it. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Navy's current role is the ARD, Acoustic Research Attachment in Bayview, the Naval Reactors Facility in Southeast Idaho, and then the history of the Farragut Naval Training Center, where over 293,000 recruits went through. And then we want to honor all warriors, so there's an extension and a reach out for our tribes as well. Okay, there's the history there. Blue stuff is Navy. Uh, black is other things that happened there. There's actually a, a refurb center for the World War II battleship guns in uh, southeast Idaho. That was a proving ground and bombing range. So we'll concentrate on, on some of those. And the opportunity is both Farragut Naval Training Center and the acoustic research attachment are in Kootenai County. So I'm not going to ask you to spend more money or to change boundary lines, or to do any of your normal stuff. This is mostly information, one opportunity. If you have a question, feel free to zoom in and get to the end. How am I doing? Any questions so far? Okay, steaming right along. There's the history. In addition, there were uh, probably eight more ships named after Idaho cities, two after Boise, two after Arco, who after Genesee, I'm not even sure where that is. There's a couple others. Okay, what's going on? Keel was late last August. Again, a room about five times as big as this and about half as many people where a welder from the electric boat welded the initials of the sponsor on the keel. Very ceremonial, uh, not very functional. Christening, break the bottle, end of this year, more likely early next year and then commissioning placed in service after that. Here's what's happening with the uh, Virginia class. 
uh, was designed to be modular, and those modules are tested in Bayview. The sections that, um, what's the function of them, how quiet can they be, um, all, the, all the stealth improvements for U.S. submarines in the last 50 years either were developed or went through and were tested at Bayview. So Idaho is out there, 799, um, and that's the, that's the course. The next block will have significantly more modular improvements. Okay, this is where it's a little boring, but it's the bathroom. What are we supposed to be doing here? Get the word out, guys like you, schools, tribes, civic organizations, and eventually raise money. So uh, we want to, and there's words in there about all the warriors in Idaho, that's why there's a reach out to the tribe. And then our mission is state's agent. organization of the committee, where do I fit in, where could I need help, and what's going on? Here's the overview, and you see up here, former Governor Themp Kempthorne is the chair of the advisory board. He made 10 phone calls, raised a, raised a half a million dollars. We're well on our way to our target goal, which also was suggested by Governor Kempthorne as SSN 799, let's raise $799,000. What do those things go for? I'll cover that in a little bit. Uh, so there's a, a different regional, different regional committees, and here I am, up in the north. That's still being staffed out. Names are not fully on board there for all the people that have been staffed. But who's on the advisory board? Turns out there's probably two former CNOs and former head of naval reactors who live in Idaho. Uh, Admiral Grossenbacher, Admiral Johnson, friends of Admiral Grossenbacher, Governor Kempthorne, business leaders, etc. Uh, I did not qualify. <laughs> yeah, the advisory board. Where do they want to be? Well, there's a couple in uh, North Idaho, uh, not down here yet, uh, David Niskibi was the program manager for Virginia class at Naval Sea Systems Command. He now lives in Post Falls. And maybe you may know, Sue Vilo is mm -hmm. on the advisory board. Okay, that shows off the staff we have so far. And that's my area. Biggest county, least population, but tribal presence. We're working with Just hold the mic close. Keep hold it close. Yeah, I'm yeah. working okay. on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, community outreach. Eventually, we'll do fundraising. Crew visits. We're, we're trying to get the crew out here for the University of Idaho homecoming, which will be in October. Now, apparently, people on the East Coast don't know that it's the day before the opening of elk season. <laughs> so it's a challenge for us locals. They'll also come to Bayview, see the Farragut State Park, and there's a crew member uh, who grew up in Kuski, we may have a visit down there as well. So that's an opportunity here. If we can arrange it, we'll have an open house for the public uh, one of those fr Thursday, Friday, maybe Saturday night around the 10th of October. So that would be an opportunity for the community to get briefed. I'm also working with the veterans organizations to have individual uh, sub-vets, VFW, and as I mentioned with uh, Connie McGee, the DAR. Okay, that's a pitch for me. What is the submarine doing? <clears throat> Previous submarines, the class I was on, the 637, was 3,600 tons. Okay? The Los Angeles class was 6,500 tons. These guys are 7,800. The Tridents were 18,000 tons. That's the boomers. Okay? So we're building uh, a couple of these a year. Point of history, during the 60s, the U.S. Navy was commissioning one SSBN per month for three years. Wow. On top of that, they built 60 fast attack submarines. So our production is down considerably. These are amazing ships. They're amazing ships. 
what's new? Uh, we don't test reactors in Bayview. We do work on the propulsor. We do work on the larger bow array, and we do uh, work on the externals for those payload modules. Namely, where can they be positioned? How can they be shaped so that when the submarine goes to the water, wide open, it's quiet? See, most of that quieting technology was developed for Seawolf, the previous class. Expensive submarine came out of the Cold War. Uh, the goals for Virginia class were to make it uh, just as quiet, same performance parameters, but be less expensive and way less. So significant developments there. Most of the submarine noise at speed comes from the propulsor. So if you make the propulsor quiet, the submarine's quiet. And for you deer hunters, the analogy is if you're out in the woods on a, a day with a crusty snow and you stand still, you can hear the deer crusting away. But if you start walking, you make noise. For submarines, the sea wolf can run through the woods as fast as he can, still hear better than the previous guy could, standing still, listening for that deer. Little layman's analogy. So, uh, the placement of that sail, that cusp there, this bow array, all the stuff back here, the size, shape, and all the internals of that, and where to place the control surfaces, all that developed, tested, modified, improved on at Bayview. Stuff you could not do full scale. Maybe it's where you probably do. Newport News is the other Navy uh, submarine builder. They also build carriers. So there's a shared responsibility to keep them going. Excuse me, Henry. Is this being built by Electric Boat in Groton, Connecticut? It is being built by Electric Boat in Groton, but I see that some of those modules will be pulled up from uh, uh, Newport News in Virginia. Yeah, it will be commissioned, christened and commissioned in Groton. Yeah. Interesting items here again, the, uh, the baseline and then the different blocks will add different modules to improve uh, the competitive edge. Large area bow array, replaced the sphere that was there, wanted to get more weapons up front, uh, special operations forces, you know, lockout chamber. Uh, significant is in the control system was the uh, placement of, or the re replacement of the periscope. In the old design, the periscope went, it was a solid tube so you had to have your control center up near the uh, top of the ship for the scope to go up. The new submarines do not have an optical periscope, so there's no steely-eyed killer of the deep looking at the optics. It's all electronic. So then you can move the control center down, and you have more space for weapons control, uh, intelligence gathering. And more freedom for determining location, and then with some changes in machinery development and propulsion and uh, electrical distribution, you can change how the, the aft end of the ship is organized as well. So a lot of flexibility went into the improvements from Seawolf to Virginia class. Okay, so no more these guys replaced by a screen that can go 360 probably in about five seconds, scope comes down, no radar detection, and you get a full sweep of what's going on. It scared the heck out of me, quite frankly. <laughs> okay, uh, website is, like all website guys know, it'll be out next week for the last two months. It'll be out next week. And that'll be a place for landing, for uh, volunteers to sign up, for fundraising to uh, be initiated. We've got uh, an extensive history. A lady is uh, a historian, and she is pulling stuff. Uh, 
just out of the woodwork on the, the Navy's presence in, in Idaho. And there's a few minute video on the cutthroat um, out in the Bayview. And then there'll be links to, you could read for days. It's a good thing. And I think that's about time for me to Any questions for Henry? So how, what are you asking? How do we get involved? Good question. How can you get involved? Again, I'm not asking for money. So in uh, if it would please the commissioners, a uh, resolution of endorsement, okay. you know, all those, we whereas the acoustic research attachment is the surrogate Naval Training Center and stuff. We could do that, sure. Uh, and I have a draft I can That'd be great. Yeah. To, okay. to help Send it to us. Absolutely. When did you say commissioning was? Probably uh, 2022. Okay. How long is the build? Is it two years, three years? Sorry. How long does it take to build? Well, Kill Q was laid in August of 20. And that's nominally the start of construction. Okay. The, the uh, core, the reactor, is just about ready to be turned over to the Navy. So therefore, the Navy uh, crewmen have to uh, be present all the time after that meeting. The CO or XO has to be uh, on board. They've named the two, since the, they only can have half the crew come to work at any one day, they named the two crews, the uh, Vandals and the... Uh, Boise State guys? Broncos? Oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. They have the two crews there. Um, okay. Any other questions? Um, yes. Great question. Okay, here's how that happens. Somewhat funny. A corporation <laughs> donates $50,000. They get a few seats at the commissioning. An individual, it's a public event, but tickets are limited, of course. That will come out in the uh, uh, website, certainly com. There's opportunities for individuals to do, uh, contribute, uh, small companies to contribute, and then the big guys. And we hope to see if Buck will do a commemorative knife as a mm -hmm. donation in kind or something like that. So. Uh, uh, Snake River Farms, the Wagyu beef guys at 60 bucks a bite, they want to cater the cruise commissioning dinner mm. here. Big deal. And where, uh, where will the commissioning be? It'll be in Connecticut. Connecticut. Yeah. And the cruise dinner will be there as well. Yeah. So fundraising, uh, after a good start, we'll be looking at... Uh, uh, what can a sponsor expect? Your dental office, uh, your auto mechanic, they want to donate, they'll get a plaque or a license plate or commemorative coins or, you know, some small amount. And then the bigger donors will get. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Absolutely. Get it and, to uh, us, and we'll take it from there. Tina's going to put my contact information in the minutes. Uh, eventually, we need help. <laughs> Thank All right. Thank you so much. Okay, then. So let's move on to a uh, second item. Uh, Panhandle Village Water System Block Grant Application Proposal. I'm indicated for this, but I'm going to turn it over to Jody. Jody, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, working with Wells Comer and Panhandle Village Water System, the RMO is seeking the board's approval to submit a grant application to the Idaho Department of Commerce under the Community Development Block Grant Program on behalf of Panhandle Village. It's a water association in Rathroom, by the way. The, the grant application will request $500,000 with the total estimated cost of the project around 4.2 million other funding sources have been identified. Since the grant application process is extensive, 
we are seeking the board's approval to submit a grant application, and we have done similar grant applications with Alpine Water and Sewer System, Bayview, and others similar that were applying for block grants. And the city or county are the only two eligible applicants, and that is why Panhandle Village is seeking our collaboration and submitting their grant application. Okay. Go ahead. Jody, um, this is Leslie. What time is involved um, on this versus what time was spent on the other um, grant that we did for the um, internet infrastructure? Uh, the difference is that Panhandle Area Council PAC uh, will be actually the grant administrator and the application, the, you know, they will put together the application. Okay. Uh, and we will submit it. So the difference in terms of time is that we will not be doing the application. Uh, we will simply be overseeing the reimbursements that are submitted by PAC on behalf of Panhandle. Okay. So essentially you're overseeing the process. Correct. And then the reimbursement. So right. okay. there will be an agreement with PAC between PAC and the county for the grant administration grant application submission. Okay. And that will be Nancy Steele. Okay, and got then it. And that agreement will come before the board for their approval. And then the grant application needs to be submitted by the Thursday before Thanksgiving. Oh. Okay, so today you're looking for direction from us. To Correct. We, we just, because it's such a heavy lift for this particular type of grant application, and a lot of effort on Welsh Comer's part, Panhandle Health, excuse me, Panhandle Village, and then PAC. We just wanted to make sure that the board was agreeable to the application. Obviously, we won't know about the award until after uh, the first of the year, but wanted to get your approval to submit the application. I'm fine. Sure. And will it just come before us uh, at a business meeting? Yes, it will. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, Bill, any questions? No questions. Okay, Jody, thank you. Okay, item number three, Idaho County's Risk Management Program, iCrimp email training. Leslie? Yeah, um, I had been uh, kind of talking a little bit to HR about this and um, a little bit to IT and iCrimp and all that. So um, I think that uh, I just wanted to hear from Grant. And I see that this, Bill, I'm not sure what number five is today, but maybe this is the, the same thing. Um, I just wanted to hear from Grant where we're at because iCrimp's asking us to do some email training that isn't really feasible in our system, but if we can do our own email training and still get a discount, then that's kind of what we're heading towards. So Grant, did you want to fill this in where we're at? Thanks, Commissioner Duncan. Um, yeah, so basically what's going on here is um, iCrimp has been getting a lot of hits from ransomware and the number one way for that type ransomware is the stuff where it comes in and encrypts all your stuff and doesn't give it back unless you pay them money um icrim's been having to pay a lot of claims on that so they're very motivated to get the counties to um, get educated and do as much as they can to mitigate this stuff email is the number one way that these um, ransom attacks end up happening and as such, they've actually partnered with a company called Know Before, to, which is a company that does simulated emails. So you could actually send out emails that look bad, um, and it gives you teachable moments with your user base. So we would actually set up our system to send out these false emails and see if people actually click on them, or if they click on a, what we would end up providing a button in their email that says, I think this is bad. And so what iCrimp, their goal is, is to see these click counts go down by, by April. Um, there's a lot of administration to run a system like this. Um, as you know, we're always telling you we don't have time to do things anyway, but I believe it is a worthy um, investment of IT's time to try to do something like this. Where we've arrived at at this point is we've brought the Know Before software into the system. We've tried it. Unfortunately, the Know Before software will not work with the complexities of our system. We've worked with Know Before support on this, and they don't have an answer for us. Um, so what that means is we have about an $800,000 premium and no before wants to give the county a 1% discount if we manage this system and if we, they see our click counts go down and everything. 
um, that equates to about eight thousand dollars so at this point we can't make their free software work for us so that leaves us with not a good decision but um, possibly a better out of two one decision would be do nothing and eat the eight thousand dollars and move on about our day solution two would be go with a system that we have looked at already a, a competitive product it costs about ten thousand dollars and then we would actually have the email training going on my personal opinion here is that it is a wor again a worthy uh, investment of our time and our dollars to get a system like this up and running to educate our users and hopefully uh, get that education out there to prevent um, one of these catastrophes and we've seen them locally so it's it's nothing to turn a blind eye to so that's what I'm saying here is again we don't have a good decision the best the best solution would have been use the no before if it worked and we save eight thousand dollars on our premium that's not going to happen Doesn't work. Okay. so like I said we can do nothing which would essentially cost us eight thousand dollars or we can adopt another system it's going to cost us ten thousand, eleven thousand, somewhere. So basically, a net change of about three thousand dollars, we could have a system put in place, um, and and that would be my advice to the board at this point is that we do try to proceed down that path and and put that into place. Okay, source of funds. Um, I believe it could be covered this year in uh, IT's uh, budget, and then we would request a base budget increase for the amount of about ten thousand. But as long as iCrimp continues their um, rebate program, essentially we'll be getting $8,000 credit every year. Correct, yes. iCrimp has stated that with a, a similar product that we could still qualify for this. Okay, so basically we'd be out of pocket about two to 3000 At the end, yeah. At the end, All okay. Said and done. Okay, bring it forth to a business meeting. Yep, I'm fine with it. Let's do it. Bill, you okay? Yes, that sounds fine. Grant, Grant explained this to me last week, and it sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Okay, super. Thank you, Grant. Okay, hey, um, oh, I Num guess you guys need to move on. Yeah. Sorry. Number four is Grant. Number four. Oh, you, okay, go right ahead. So this is email solution for Public Defender. Go. Okay, so Public Defender brought a concern to us several months ago um, about how we do our public records requests here in the county. Um, basically, we've got a very sensitive situation at Public Defender, given what they do. Um, and when we get a public records request for email, we need to make sure that we have absolutely no emails that could be infringing on um, attorney-client privileges in the Public Defender's Department. We've tested this with our current system. Our current system is designed to back up and reproduce emails at need. It is not designed um, for a litigation-type setting, which is what we're talking about here when we're talking about absolutely needs to be uh, figured out so the the long story short here is the current system will not work we've investigated a new system that's based on litigation that will work it's going to cost us an extra fourteen thousand dollars a year to run this thing um, year one is going to be about thirty seven thousand dollars to purchase this thing and to put it in place with an ongoing cost of twenty three thousand dollars annually currently we pay t um, nine thousand dollars in support for um, the system that we're running right now that system would be replaced by this that's how we get the net change of only fourteen thousand dollars annually um, this is a very specific need to the public defender um, and it is very much in tune with some verbiage that's come out recently um, on some do some grant dollars they receive as far as how to secure their IT infrastructure um, so there may be there may be an opportunity there to use those grant dollars um, if all parties involved agree uh, to cover that $14,000 increase. Otherwise, that's what we'd be looking at next fiscal year is a $14,000 increase um, to base budget. This year, we just put in the new email firewall and we realized a significant savings on that project and we do think that we could cover year one completely out of the IT budget. Okay, so take me back to the 37,000. Yes, that's the initial, initial one-time purchase. Non-recurring. So that's, okay. um, yeah, that's the $23,000 of support that this thing takes to operate, plus the, the remainder is um, just purchasing the product the 14, and, and uh, mm -hmm. professional engineering, things like that, to get it okay. all up to speed and put in place. Okay. And then, yeah, year two and four will be changed. Did you say IT budget? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, for the initial, then we can have a discussion with Anne and the grant to see if it will remain in IT for the 14000 or if um, PDC will cover that specifically. 
you know, so we'll, but that's something that it's an ongoing conversation that we can't make a decision today on where that funds are gonna come from coming forward. But um, I'm very interested in moving ahead with this because I think it'll save us millions of dollars in the end. I agree. So since year one would be coming out of IT as well, just go ahead and take this uh, out of the manual. Right? Yep. I'm, yep. Yes, I'm fine with that. Yep. Okay. Bill, you okay? As soon as I get my mic off mute, yes, I'm fine. Okay. Right. Is the next one you as well? Yes, sir. Email security training. Um, I need a calculator here. Oh, no, <laughs> uh, we're on number six now, I believe. Oh, number, yeah, the sheriff. Oh, okay, so four and five, are, okay, go right ahead. Um, so this is just a really brief update on the um, camera project that's going on out at the uh, sheriff's um, campus. We've run into a slight um, hiccup that we weren't sh we, we didn't know we were going to run into. Basically, when you last heard from me, we were um, proceeding with a project where we have funding to secure engineering to architect this system and then take it out to bid and finally um, use um, fund balance to uh, fund the system once, once we know what that's going to be. Um, what we've run into is Idaho State statute is requiring us because this is looking like it's going to be very close to the neighborhood of $25,000 or over, we're going to have to secure three quotes from different architects before we can even proceed with architecture, the architecture of this thing. So um, we do have contacts for other architectural firms. We're going to get in touch with them. Um, but just um, Commissioner Brooks uh, asked that we, uh, that I update the board on the status of that and why it would be uh, having a, a slight uh, time delay on that date. Okay. okay. And, and so what's causing the change? Um, we were we were thinking that we would be able to go directly to an engineering firm and just start oh, I working see. with okay. them. We have a firm um, out of Seattle that has worked with the jail before. They know the systems, um, and we were just going to proceed down that path. But um, we thought the the statute was calling for a fifty thousand um, dollar minimum to, to start before we had to start getting multiple but it bids, actually yeah. is twenty five thousand. Okay. So fair enough. We all good. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Okay, moving on to item seven, microphone training. Bill. Yes, well, especially since I've been home due to the uh, COVID quarantine, uh, I have been following uh, everything either on YouTube and or on the phone. Uh, sometimes it takes both because I can see on YouTube, but there's a del quite a delay. But the big thing that uh, is just across the board, obviously people think if there's a microphone in the room, they can be heard. And that is not true, uh, especially with those handheld mics. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, uh, Chris, could somebody give you a handheld mic there for a moment? He was getting it. Even if it's off, especially, you should probably turn it off. Did I say turn it off? Yeah. So I think he's just trying to demonstrate where you're Turn hold it off it. so it doesn't. Feedback. All right, so it's Position, off. Positioning. All right, so it's off now. Go ahead. What did you want? I'm on my standard mic now. Yeah. Okay, uh, just uh, take the handheld mic and, and uh, stand at a profile to the camera. He's trying to have you teach people how to camera. use the handheld mics. Okay. Can you hear, oh yeah, you can. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Proper yes, you can. Proper position for a handheld mic. Yeah, the proper, well, the proper position for a handheld mic is two finger width from your mouth. If you could demonstrate that. Okay, so if I hold two fingers, this is about right where I am right now. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you, yes, but there, yes, yeah. But just put your, put two fingers up. So I probably should hold it a little below That's mouth level, but two fingers away. Is this any better? I can't see you, Chris. Oh, where, where's that a delay? Oh. Can you see me now? There. 
Uh, that's the proper position for a that's the proper position for a handheld mic. Okay. If you turn your head without moving the mic, yeah, that, then we're that's exactly you're going to lose transmission. If you, right. If so you the, turn your head and without moving the mic, you lose you lose good audio. Okay. So the mic has to move with the head and stay within two the, fingers you've got of the. You've to hold the. Go ahead. Yeah. Now turn turn sideways. Turn sideways. Like this. Or do you just want me to turn yeah. my head? Is this the is thing this about that is like this? Yeah, you so have you want to, you have to move the you have to move the mic within that two finger distance of your mouth. Understood. Uh, whether you're no matter what your your way your head is uh, oriented. I did uh, a number of years uh, in in radio broad. That's very good. Number of years in radio broadcasting okay. and also in TV. And yeah, exactly. I, I say what you're doing now. It's very, that's it, exactly right. Okay, and the hand, so, so the little desk mics, you really have to get them within that distance of your uh, of your face. Now I know we're working on some some uh, solutions to these problems, but just so people see, it makes a difference. Okay, so the mic moves with the head, thusly. <laughs> exactly within okay. that two finger distance to the mouth. Fair enough. Thank you. And, and, when, and when we get a guy like uh, Grant, who uh, when he stands up to that mic, uh, it hits him in the belly button. <laughs> That's very difficult, uh, uh, you know, to adjust those desk mics to be uh, the proper distance. Okay. But that, if, if we do that, if we try to do that, if we try to do that, we will, we will provide much more information to the people watching on YouTube and, and the people tuning in live. And that's, that was my only thing. It's a, hopefully that will be a short, easy lesson. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, you're welcome. Any questions for Bill? <laughs> You're straightforward. All right, then, spending policy 930. Did you want to keep going with this, or do you want to skip over 8 and 9? Uh, no, we're fine. We, we've, I just, if we were hitting the 12 o'clock mark, oh, then okay. we could we could do okay, it, but so it's item, here. And it's item number eight, spending. Yeah. Oh, phew. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, item number eight, spending policy 930. Leslie, go. So uh, there's been some confusion lately, and maybe it's just been on my part. Um, my understanding that 930 just affects what, and it's a combination, when a budget line item has been overspent plus they're looking at a purchase that is $5,000 or more, then they must come to the board. So otherwise, if it's budgeted, they don't need to come to the board. doesn't matter if it's a $200,000 purchase or a $10,000 purchase. If it's in their budget, they do not need to come before the board. Now, what I kind of wanted um, Dave Ferguson here for is to ask about car contracts which is separate from the policy because the way I read the policy is if it's in the budget, nobody needs to come forth to spend the money no matter what the amount is. But a car contract, it's signing a contract. So if a department is authorized to spend that money on a vehicle, do they still need to come before the board with that contract? So are you referring then like multi-year as we're doing with... No, 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 no. Just a single oh, purchase okay, okay. in a budget year. You had the microphone. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Mic microphone shy, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll try to be as concise as possible. Um, there's nowhere in the Idaho Code that gives the Board of Commissioners specifically the authority to delegate spending authority. There's no statute that speaks to you can delegate up to a certain amount or below a certain amount or anything to that effect. The, the code is a little bit vague um, about whether or not the board can delegate authority at all for spending. The code is pretty, pretty clear to the extent that um, it's only the board that has the power to fix a budget, to sign a budget, approve a budget, work with the elected officials to create a budget. Only the board has the power to spend money, to acquire property, to personal and real property, to sell property, um, to fix salaries, 
um, so on and so forth. Those are just examples of spending that the board would do under certain circumstances. Um, there's no authority anywhere that the code specifically gives any board to delegate authority for spending. We have some old Idaho Supreme Court case law where um, elected officials were attempting to spend money even within the budget. The board did not want to, in particular cases, Magoon, an old 1932 case, I believe, where a sheriff wanted to buy a particular vehicle for a, just a couple of thousand dollars. He had spending authority in his budget to do so. The Board of Commissioners said, I don't want you to buy a car A, I want you to buy a car B. Um, Supreme Court said, they litigated the case. Um, the, budget, the sheriff wanted to spend money within his budget because he believed he had, that gave him spending authority. Idaho Supreme Court said, budget authority is not equal spending authority. Affirm the power and the right of the Board of Commissioners to disaffirm that contract that the sheriff had made and say, no, you have to buy the car we want you to buy. Okay. Okay. So having said all of that, in my experience in the last 10 years, this board and prior boards have delegated spending authority to elected officials up to $5,000. My understanding of that authority has always been, and I actually just talked to Darren Murphy about this issue a little bit before I came in here. I believe mine and, and his, and I think the other lawyers in my office probably would agree with this. Our understanding of that spending authority has been as a matter of convenience, in other words, the board doesn't necessarily want to be in the business of approving every purchase of de minimis items like pencils and pens, desk chairs, and things like that that are already budgeted. They would, the board would prefer not to have phone calls from every elected official about, I need to spend $200 on some paper today, can I do that? So the board is granted authority uh, for spending up to $5,000 as long as it's within the budget. However, having said that, I'm not certain that that authority is really granted by Idaho law. I don't know what would happen if that issue were to be litigated today in court um, because I don't know if it's a matter of degree or just whether or not the board can delegate the authority at all. If one dollar is okay, then presumably any amount of dollars would be okay. I'm not sure Idaho code really provides for that because it's within the board's power to spend money, not elected officials or anyone else for that. Um, the board may overlay, or sorry, the, a court may overlay some sort of a reasonableness analysis mm -hmm. that for the, for, the, for the sake of moving business along at the county, uh, spending a rel relatively de minimis amount of the overall budget, like $5,000 is probably mm -hmm. okay. The court may do that, but, but I don't know what the outcome would be. Okay. okay. So as far as spending money, um, I think the safe thing to do is stick with the $5,000 authority. Okay. And I don't necessarily agree with the idea that any elected official can spend any amount of money over 5000 as long as it doesn't exceed the budget. I, I don't think that, now that I'm reading this in this policy, I don't think that's really the way it, it was intended to work. Okay, so then that, that brings me to two things. Number one, the commissioners actually approve every single penny spent in the payables each week. So for that, I, I understand right. that part of it. So right. we're still I believe okay. that's that practice is appropriate yes. and required. By yes, the way. and so, so I'm good with that part of it. Um, the $5,000 um, thing, so I think that our policy needs to be changed, and that's why I brought it up, because like you said, you don't think that was the intent of the original policy that it has to be outside a line item. Um, but I also wanna know, if we're approving the payables every week, why would we need somebody to come, if I said, okay, AMP can, can spend $25,000 on a vehicle, why would they need to come back to the board when that's what it is, I'm gonna see it on the payable, and because it happens after the fact okay so uh, i don't believe the board has the power to delegate the authority to make contracts okay so that's the difference that's what i'm saying if it so, requires a contract for a purchase it needs to come before the board if it they're buying 200 dollars worth of paper on their p card that doesn't we will see that on the payables and that will be approved and we're fine it's a little bit 
different species of the same issue, but again, back to what would a court do with sort of de minimis purchase items and the, this board has decided to allow authority up to say 5,000. I think that would probably be okay. Uh, but again, if the board attempted to just delegate blanket authority for making you know, contracts, um, I, I don't think that's gonna pass. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting yeah. that. And it really goes back to what you said earlier, Dave, budget authority is not spending authority. Yeah, right. that's, that, that's right. And the case so law is clear court, about yeah. that. Right. And I would caution the board in attempting to delegate contracting authority because what you don't want to be is in the position of having some equitable claim that I mean, this issue was litigated at length in Bonner County concerning its airport about whether some agent of the county or perceived person with authority who never really had actual authority to make a contract with a third party. That third party then came back and said, county, you have to you have to follow this contract. We made a contract. Even though this agent of the county really didn't even have authority of the board, uh, you know, the, the case was litigated to the tune of several million dollars because that third party wanted to enforce that contract back against the county. I would not want to be in a position, if I were this board or any other board, to leave any elected official or agent of this county with the idea that they have the power or the authority to, to make a contract at the outset only this board has that power. Okay. So, so I wouldn't any, want to leave that impression. So any one-time purchase that requires a contract or actually any contract at all needs to come before the board. So that's yeah, I agree with that's that. totally fine. So if you're okay, I will work with you in changing this policy and I'll bring it back before the board and then we'll have another discussion to see if that's suitable. Yeah. S same issue if it's a one-time purchase without a yeah. if it's without a contract. Yeah, I agree with that. Can I also say just for yeah. the sake of Attorney-client confidentiality, confidentiality. This is why lawyers don't normally like to do this on the record. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I prefer to share these kinds of thoughts. That's fine. Written, That's fine. Written, uh, written opinions. Sure, I just I'm, need. I'm to happy. I'm happy to get on the mic. Sure. But now we don't have attorney-client privilege about these issues. Oh, fair. Sure. Okay. Got it. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, fleet management role. Well, I don't know, Dina. Did you have something to add to that? When I look at policy 930, mm -hmm. it talks about excess funds, mm -hmm. not budgeted funds. So I guess when we're putting that together and we're talking about, okay, what comes before the board, what doesn't come before the board, does it have a contract, is there going to be a dollar limit, and it, does it apply to budgeted and approved funds or just excess and above budgeted items? So right. Just so something to think about. So Thank we need you. to take that up with Dave. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that. Okay. Fleet management? Yes. Okay, item number nine, fleet management yep, role. And I apologize for all the fleet managers here who have been sitting here the whole time. Um, I am wondering if we could talk about fleet management making the purchases, because now we know that each vehicle purchase that requires a contract needs to come before the board. So I'm wondering if that's something that fleet management has um, margin to do and not just say, okay, you know, we see these people are giving away cars and we see these people need cars, so we're going to match this. But if we see that, okay, this group, this group, this group has been budgeted vehicles, then fleet management is going to take it through the process of, okay, so we need two SUVs, two pickup trucks, and, you know, a third special or another specialty vehicle, and then fleet management brings that before the board and says, okay, we're purchasing five vehicles this month, they're all budgeted, here's the contracts. So it's just a discussion if fleet management would be interested in expanding their role, um, or if they're not. Uh, it just seems like we've had a lot of vehicles purchased in the last really four months that seem to come from all different angles and all different areas. And for me, it would be helpful if it went through a process. Um, but I also don't want to, I mean, we've had building and grounds are like, we don't have a truck, we need a truck yesterday. So I also don't want to clog the process where if it's an emergency that it can't be, you know, okay, well, I'm sorry, it's a six month process if you go through fleet management. I don't want that either. So I just kind of wanted some information or some ideas um, 
Nick's on vacation, so we won't have him. But I think, is uh, Kim, are you on the line? Is Kim Riley calling? No, she didn't. Okay. So, um, Isaac, I don't know if you want to speak to this. Keith, um, you guys are both on the... Um, Hey, Leslie, this is Jody. Since Kim isn't on the wire, do you, do you think that maybe she could provide some insight at, a, at another time? Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely, Jody. Um, so this is, no decisions are being made here. I just wanted to get a feel for how people were thinking about it as we start the budget process. So we kind of know when vehicles are approved, then what's the next step? Is that, is it yes, absolutely. I just was curious if we're open to that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, go ahead, so, Isaac. Uh, Isaac, uh, Auditor, Auditor's Office. Um, so I guess kind of my, just right off the top of my head, my first kind of thought is, I guess when I kind of envision the fleet management process that we have now, it kind of seems like it's set up for um, pretty heavy in the in the budgetary, like approval, like this is kind of kind of advising the board of, these are what people have brought forward and what they need. Um, I don't know how much it would kind of slow down, like in those cases with like building and grounds and things where it kind of, um, the, like these emergencies pop up. I, um, I don't know how that would, it would affect that process, I guess. And then, um, and also at what point, since there's not like a central purchasing uh, within the county, I guess how that would affect the individual purchasing, uh, I'll just say departments, like whoever the representative is. I don't know how that kind of would interact there. I guess right. that's kind of my thought. Well, I think right now they're getting <coughs> piggyback. They're getting state prices on state contract. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how that's happening here. But that's what I'm thinking is if we wanted to do that, have fleet management operate as that vehicle procurement portion and say, okay, we need five vehicles. Who's going to give us the best price because we need five vehicles instead of this department needs one. Oh, a week later, this department needs another one. This department needs two, that kind of thing. So, and I mean, there might not be any additional savings to be had because they are already on that state contract, but I was just trying to figure out if there's still just a, a just a better way, just a better way to save taxpayer dollars, just a better way to have the system. Uh, Jody, is there a role for you guys here in consolidating this and making it move any faster or more efficient? I, I think I would really love the opportunity to get with Tina and Kim and talk about what you're discussing and propose then to the board a process that we would potentially recommend to you for approval. So, yeah, so, but I just, I just wanted to talk about vehicles and not necessarily anything bigger than than that, use the vehicles as a no, segment. I, I'm, think I, I'm referring specifically to fleet management. Okay. Specifically in the context of what you're describing. Thank you, Jody. I, I would want the opportunity to speak to Isaac, Dina, and Kim, and then come back to the board as a unit. Perfect. That makes sense. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. One quick question. Just yeah, follow up. Keith, that's for, from AMP. When I first started here, it used to be, did you get approval from fleet management? For your, uh, you know, to, along with the budgetary part of it, uh, it's we're not looking. It kind of got away from that because there was so many specialty vehicles being ordered, and then eventually what we did is we separated out from the sheriff's department and the county because the specialty of the, the equipment and everything else that was needed. And then last year, uh, was it last year or the year before, we went to the lease for the sheriff's office and everything else. I think a lot of it too. We kind of spread it apart because uh, the great pa uh, the last passing of a great man, uh, Rich Hauser, passed away. He was a leader over the the group. So my suggestion is is bring him back. A, a, you know, elected official that has you know has the background and has the background of what we've done in the past and stuff like that. Um, I hate to throw Steve under the bus, but <laughs> I'd like to have maybe um, you know a, tr a treasurer come in and be a part of that, leading the group and giving direction. Kim is a vital part, Isaac's vital, Dina. All, all of them are very vital to the, how we do this uh, program. Um, their intelligence of bringing into the different aspects of it was is, is great, because that's why they got that okay. the lease went through. Yeah. So yeah. long story short, I'd like to see us probably come back together. There is a form on the county website for purchases of vehicles and stuff like that, and have it run through. Um, 
but again, I think we got away from it because there were so many specialty vehicles, like, you know, public works needed this and that, you know, and, but we're not trying to take away from them. And let's still let them have something to say. Okay. Fair enough. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, let's move on. All right. Thank you, Isaac, Keith. Thank you, commissioners. I, you bet. Mm -hmm. Item number 10, legislation updates. Leslie. Yeah, so I guess at today's 3 o'clock call, we'll get mm -hmm. um, the latest information from IAC. Um, there has been another bill uh, put forward. I don't know exactly what process it is in, but the latest is that they would not touch, the legislature would not touch the 3% ability um, to raise tax but they would take new growth and URDs and um, do those percentage wise. So we would only be able to take 75% of new growth, only 50% of returning URDs. So they, they would cap those two items. And then what they would also do is cap the budget uh, increase overall to 4% if any foregone was taken at all. So if new growth was, um, half a percent and um, the budget was raised 3%, that's three and a half, and if an uh, entity wanted to take foregone for that other um, half a percent, it would be capped. They wouldn't be able to get into all their foregone balance. They would only be able to get up to 4%. So um, it, it looks like if you had 2% new growth and 3% tax raise, then you could do a 5% overall. But if you use foregone, you're capped hard at four percent. No oh, matter oh, what oh, the other okay, things are. Okay. Yep. Okay. Do so. So go back just real quick. Go back. So seventy-five. So they're suggesting or proposing seventy-five percent of new growth. Go ahead. Yes, and fifty percent of returning URDs because what happens with that extra twenty-five percent and that extra fifty percent? It widens the base, which effectively will lower the levy rate, and that's what the legislature is looking for um, to give property tax relief. Okay. So once again, this is in the baby stage, and it um, it's being heard in committee. So it's not, um, it's just like the other two bills. We just look at it, um, which uh, Dina and Steve and I will um, formulate some responses to the Senate on this and um, just keep moving forward. And like I said, today at three o'clock, we'll find out more. The other thing I wanted to bring up was um, 1060, which is a Senate bill on Panhandle, not Panhandle, sorry, all health districts in the state of Idaho and uh, what their, um, their mandates would need to then be approved by county commissioners if it is a countywide or district-wide mandate. And that is supposed to be heard on the floor today, but they have a pretty full schedule, so it may be pushed out this week. So made it out of committee and it's on the Senate floor. Okay, Dina, please. Yeah, that I don't know, and we should know that at three o'clock today. So what's happening with 1048, which was the original? It's gone. It's now 1108. Oh, it's now 10, 1108. Yeah, 1048 is gone. 1108 has replaced it. But like I said, I don't know. I, there's a thing about it being printed, not printed. It's a draft. So we'll find out more at, at 3. So this is so, I, so while Leslie <laughs> was talking, I was doing some quick math. So basically, this is kind of interesting. If they're giving us, uh, what is it, 75% of new growth? Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to go back to fiscal 20 because that's what's on my mind. Fiscal 20, we took 1.2 mil and new growth, we would only take 900,000, so we lose 300 there. Now watch this, go to the URDs. We're expected to get this year roughly 3.4, 50% of that is 1.7. So instead of having roughly 4.6 million in revenue, we get 2.6, we just forfeited 2 million bucks. Yep, and that's in new growth, so that's what's supposed to be paying for itself. So. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, bond ballot, excuse me, bond ballot language. This is for the new, uh, new building. Yes, so what I would like to know is if I have a second to move forward in producing language 
um, for a May ballot for a general obligation bond for the new building. I'm okay with it, Bill. That's fine. I'd like to hear the language. Well, yeah, that and that's the, well, yeah, right. The motion, if you, you want to call it a motion, is to proceed with the drafting of the, which I presume I don't know how many of you have seen this would look something similar to yes. the Twin Falls. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Any, any questions? Yeah, Dina. Nope, actual bond. It's we can only bond. only do advisory votes in even years. And yes. and the other thing is, as long as I'm sorry, Steve. Maybe I shouldn't speak until I get. I misunderstood when we communicated last week. I thought you wanted me to go ahead and yes, I've drafted some language if you'd like it. Yes, oh, please. Okay, better Thank yet. you. Yeah, so I wasn't sure where we were at with that. I know that um, I asked you if you could do that. I just wasn't sure if we were had a second vote to do that. Okay, so we'll need to digest this. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so that everybody's on the same page. This is basically the go ahead for the drafting of the language, which thankfully Steve's already done. It's not necessarily a formal approval of putting it on the ballot. Correct. The board has to vote on that. That comes later. Yes. Got it? Okay. Yep, and we'll bring that to a business meeting for official approval if that's go. the direction that this board chooses. Right. Are we okay then? Okay, so we have one more item. Just our oh, yeah, that's list. our pending list. This should be pretty fast. Citizen Advisory Committee. Okay, Bill, you've got that put off until late October. Bill? Sorry. Uh, no, it's not going to be October. Uh, it's now February. I figure that'll be done, uh, uh, completed in March. Okay, now th this is the advisory committee, correct? We're talking about the same thing? Uh, uh, yes, it says advisor, the advisory committee on the uh, those things in the... Uh, ordinances that can be uh, uh, eliminated, changed, or otherwise modified to reflect what's happening today and not what happened 40 years ago. Okay. Alternative form of government? Okay, so you, I guess you were planning to have a draft ready. Uh, I, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty honestly pretty much done with that. Uh, but I did, uh, uh, was talking with an attorney and he said, give me four or five days to go through every period comment. And so we have a pretty polished, uh, uh, draft to, to provide to the board, uh, next, next Monday. He said he could do it by then. Okay, cool. So that's what I would, uh, would say there. It will, it will be done in your hands in a good form for you to then edit and change and look at and we can discuss it next Monday. Okay, so that would be the 22nd. Right, okay. Yes, correct. Uh, facilities expansion, anything? Let just We're just meeting on the 17th and 18th this week, so we'll know more Monday. Okay, cool. Pack Airport lease? Same thing, just waiting to, to hear. I'm keeping up with Wally about once a month, so this is... Uh, you know, you're going to get the same answer three weeks of the of the month. This goes back like four years. Okay, one A one B audio upgrade for this uh, room, Nancy. Perfect. Okay. And financial snapshot. Not until That's March first. Of the month. Okay, got it. Yep, that is fine. Okay, fair enough. Move to March 8th. Okay, public comment. None? Yes, Chris, this is Jennifer Locke. Yeah, go right okay. ahead, Jen. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Oh, uh, this is Jennifer Locke, Chief Deputy Clerk. I just want to say for the May 18th ele election, the language for any bond would have to be submitted by March 29th. 
And then for the November 2nd election, that would be by September 13th. Okay, but what I would like to do, Jennifer, is have this in your hands by March 15th to give you the full 60 days for the language. Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. All right. Thank you, guys. Jen, what was it again for November? September 13th. September, was it what? Um, sure. If you want to do the November 2nd election, that's September 13th. The language has to be submitted by. Yeah, no, we're shooting for May anyway, but I was just yep. curious. Okay. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Public comment? Hearing none, 1208, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Longer.